Well, thank you for inviting me, and I hope I'm not making this too boring. Um, who had trouble last year with Harvest? Everybody? So the good news is you're not alone. It's, it was from Alberta to Manitoba, I guess, even into Ontario, I think they're still trying to harvest. Um, so I'm just going to, I mean, it's, it's tough to talk to somebody about how do you improve quality. I mean, there's so many things you can do, right, and so many reasons that fall into place why you end up with poor quality. But I'm just going to tell you what we do, and then we can maybe have more questions. So I'm going to go through it quick. Just to show you where we are, we're just 35 minutes southeast of Regina, heavy clay soils. Supposed to have 15 inch rainfall. Uh, last couple of years we had three or less until harvest started. Um, here's our place. Um, we do lots of grain cleaning for ourselves, dr grain drying, um, yeah, pretty much what everybody does. So here's what we do, 10,000 acres, 6,500 are now certified and we just turned the last 3,500 into transition. Um, every acre is farmed under the nutritional farming system, diverse crops, cover crops, intercrops, green manures. Yeah, and uh, those are the crops we have this year coming up. Um, spring wheat, oats, flax, lentils, alfalfa seed, corazon wheat, spelt, MRPs, canary seed. Peas and canary seed are the ones that are in transition. And then the cover uh, the intercrops. And I mean, there's, there is no right or wrong answer. There's so many different crops you can grow together. To tell you the truth, on the intercropping, we actually backed off the last couple of years because we're creating more work with sometimes no return. And we're going more heavier into the cereal clover rotation. It's still an intercrop, but it's just we harvest one crop. So, I mean, I have the cedar here, so I, I you know, it took me a while to come up with some smart ideas how to improve quality. I think actually it starts at seeding time. Uh, well sown is half grown, that's what I've heard for many years now and I think it's, it's true, even especially in the organic side. Because sometimes when we do touch the ground and do start cultivating, we lose some moistures and it's important to get the crop off to a good start. And I think that's where good quality grain, I mean, yes, if it starts raining when you start, when you take your combine out, I mean, that's, it doesn't matter how good you seed, but to have an even crop that comes in even and gives you a better chance to go in and harvest it, I think it starts at seeding time. Um, the next tool we have is don't sell your swathers. Buy a swather, it's a good time right now, I think they're cheap. Um, Swathing for us is another tool. Um, we don't swath everything, but if we have to, we do lay it down. That's a picture of spring rye under seeded with yellow blossom sweet clover. And um, just like that field, it had 75% hail on it in July. Um, we couldn't have commented without swathing it. There would have been too much clover in it. We only laid that, that, uh, that rye down for two days just to get the clover dried out a little bit. And we came in with the combine, 18%, and took it off. And like where we were last year, we had those three, four days windows where we had the opportunity to harvest and then it rained again, right? And you guys probably had the same. And to figure out how to use those three, four days, without putting too much in a swath was our challenging factor. And uh, that's our grain dryer. And I think we would be in trouble this year if we wouldn't have had it. All, just about all my organic acres went through that dryer. And uh, you know, that's our first year. I mean, we just put it up this spring and 
the reason we, we put it up was last two years ago when we had that snow early. I, you know, I said, you know, nature is showing us what it can do to us, and I think it's just too risky not to have tools available, and especially on the organic side where we talk about $29, $30 a bushel. We're talking about lots of value, and I think <clears throat> that's, for me, that's our most important tool for good quality grain, because it gives us a wider window to harvest. Then, uh, just talking about separating intercrops, what we do is, this one here, you can make it as complicated as you want to or as easy as you want to. Um, this one, you can see here, it's just a vibratory with two decks. And if you want to int separate intercrops a really fast way and a cheap way, um, that is a good tool. Uh, we put an aspirator in the front to suck out the fines and dust, and you can separate the intercrop for 500 bushels an hour. Um, if you want to start out that way, I, I think it's a good tool. We actually had to add this one to our cleaning plant. Uh, this one is just an air and screen separator, and we, we found out the hard way that if you have an intercrop that's 50-50, you're trying to separate, well, 50% is dockage, right? Like dockage is a different crop. Those cleaners are not made for 50% dockage. It's, they're made for 5, 6, 10% dockage. And we couldn't get the sec, like the intercrop, we couldn't get that away fast enough. And uh, that's why we added the vibratory. And that's pretty much how we separate all our intercrops. Um, on this picture, actually, on the vibratory, we're actually not going in through the cleaner, we're taking it straight out to the truck. And like I said, you can make it as complicated as you want to. I mean, um, you can add another indent to it, gravity table, or color sorter if you have to, and that's what we decided to do, and just to give us more tools. And I, th no, I have one more slide. Or you can make it really simple. I've done that before at the same time. $8,000 rotary screen you can separate peas and mustard quite fast. So there are so many ways you can do it. Um, just have to find the best way for you. And that's my, that's my slide. And I think it's more important if you have any questions later to answer the questions and to tell me what to do, I guess. So I'm going to hand it over to Nick. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about the grain cleaning side of things. Um, I own and operate a mobile grain cleaner. Uh, so that's my rig there. Um, so it's, uh, it's made up of an indent aspirator and, uh, or sorry, scalper aspirator, indent, and an air screen. So it's a pretty basic setup as far as cleaning goes. One of the simplest. And I'm just going to go through and uh, explain how each machine works. Um, so this is, uh, this is the uh, air screen. And as Joe was saying, this is actually the same make of air screen as Joe has there. Um, for, the, for the separating different crops, you do have a limit on one of these. If you're, they're a great machine because you can be accurate um, between your sizing, but uh, they do have the, the limit of taking out so much in the dockage. Um, so, this kind of, I don't know if there's a pointer on this thing. The center one, you press a button. Okay, so, oops, sorry. So, uh, on each, each of these has a, a pair of decks. So the grain comes in the top. There's two scalp decks on the top. That basically just means, a scalp deck means you use a large, a large screen. So you take off the larger objects and you allow the good grain to go through. Um, so there's two decks there that split the grain half and half 50-50 into each deck. 
then it goes back the other way into a into a sift deck, which just means it takes out the smaller. So this, the good grain stays on top, or whatever you're trying to save and keep into the the kind of clean side of the grain will stay on top. Your smaller goes through, and so there's three decks: one deck that down to the front again, and then split deck 50/50 to the back again. Now, if you're if you're looking at purchasing a machine like this and you're thinking of intercrops, my advice would be for each deck, there's an ejection trough. So the screens, the decks for the screens just shake. And then the ejection trough is sloped out to the side. So if you're looking for a machine to do separations of large and you want to maybe start with an air screen, find a machine that there's either lots of room between the decks that you can have a chute that's steeper to carry more product, um, or that it's made with deeper troughs to begin with, so it'll carry more product. This machine, like Joe said, five to five to seven percent dockage is kind of all you can really take out, and that's mostly because the troughs are so flat. So the troughs can't actually take it out the side of the machine in time. So that's uh, definitely a weakness, but uh, but it's a great machine for diversity. I mean, you can use different screens, you can clean all kinds of things, you know, it's a very diverse piece of equipment. So here's some of the screens. So this is a buckwheat screen. Um, so these have triangles and you can get different sizes. So this would be used for sifting, for taking out the, the dockage and obviously buckwheat screen, it's for traditionally for taking your buckwheat out of your like wheat and oats and barley. Uh, the slot screens, so these can be used either for, for sifting or scalping, depending on the size. S so uh, this particular screen's a five slot, so that's for, for, like, uh, for dockage in wheat, I use that. Um, if you're going to clean grains for sale, it's always better to call your buyer, find out what they're using on their, for their screening. So if they're using a five slot for their dockage, then use a five slot to clean. Um, the slots are, so obviously with a slot you're, uh, you're sorting for width here, right? So you're taking the skinnier, the skinnier grains. Aspiration, um, so the aspirators, so on my machine I got an aspirator up here when it goes in, and I also have an aspirator on the top up here, and then there's as air suction on the back as well. And aspiration is sucking of air. Um, so you can you control the suction of the air by the volume and the uh, velocity uh, to how how heavy of a of a material you want to pull out and how much of that material you want to pull out. Basically, um, there's other there's other machines out there like the Aerome, which is an air machine and it actually blows. Um, it doesn't suck; it blows. And it would be nice if somebody would share some info on those because they're quite interesting too for dockage. Uh, indents, indents are are quite complicated as to how they work because everything's sealed and you can't see inside, so it gets a bit confusing. Um, they sort by length, um, so you basically I'm going to have to visually kind of do this. So you have a trough in the center of a roll, which is stationary. You have an auger inside that trough, which is always turning. And then you have your indent roll, which is turning. So the grain goes inside the indent roll, and you'll have a certain pocket size. So say, if you're, for example, if you're cleaning wheat, um, the wheat, if you're taking out the long grain, which is the easiest way to explain it for you guys, then uh, the wheat will sit inside your pocket. OK, so your roll's turning. So your wheat goes up through, and it gets carried quite a ways, and then it falls. Your wild oats, for example, or your longer kernels will fall, they won't fit in the pocket, so they fall in the bottom. So then you can set your trough, which, which has a setting, but it's stationary. You can change it to the point where these two crops are, are falling from. So the, the long grain will be falling short, and the short grain will be picked up in the roll and carried. So then you set it between the two, so you'll take out the shorter grain through the auger in the middle. The longer grain continues through the roll and falls out the end. So that's basically how they separate. Um, they are kind of finicky to set. There's different rolls for different crops. 
Um, the rolls are expensive, um, but if you're looking for a length separation, then that's a, a good affordable option, I guess. And that's kind of all I got for, for that one. Have you done any research into solar uh, grain drying? Not. Hello? Can you guys? Okay. Um, we, I haven't. Um, I think in the past I looked into it a little bit. Um, I know there's some um, articles out there, and we're working on um, doing a few more benchmarking um, efficiencies of some of those um, systems. Um, so, no, but yes, if that's a, <laughs> I don't have any uh, answers to share on, on them, but yeah. Another one for Charlie. Um, what is the uh, best ways to keep yourself from uh, raining on your grain in, uh, in a supplemental heated natural air system. We found that we had a lot of moisture landing on the roof, condensing on the roof in the colder hours, you know, through the night or whatever. And you really don't want to shut that system down through the night or you end up creating a front and more resistance to air movement. So uh, we ended up uh, with a lot of moist grain at the bottom corner of the bin because it was running down the roof panels and then down the walls and ending up down in the bottom where there, we have a partial floor so it was uh, not able to pick that moisture up anymore. And uh, there are different ideas about getting that moisture out the top of the bin and uh, you know, one of, one of our solutions was as we got into the colder months when we still had some drying to do, we switched to drying in a plywood bin so that the plywood absorbed the moisture and, uh, you know, wind and sunshine would take it off the outside of the bin later on. But mostly we're dealing with a metal bin and uh, it's pretty hard to get rid of that moisture. We thought about raising the roof by a half inch so that that moisture could run down and uh, and the airflow would take it out through the eave of the bin. Only thing is you have to watch out, you don't fill your bin up to where the grain is coming out there. And the other thing that people talk about is putting a big fan at the top to, to keep that air moving out the top of the bin. And the problem with that is I really uh, don't enjoy getting up on the top of these bins too much and working with something heavy like a fan. And uh, if you are moving grain in and out of that bin like you need to cycle load now and then to break up formations, then you're having to take that fan off in order to get grain down into the bin again. Yeah, so you definitely touched on all the things I would say. Um, yeah, uh, I kind of skipped over it, but definitely ventilation of some sort on the roof is um, is important to avoid the, the, the issue of condensation running down the your bins, um, especially yeah in the winter, and then it'll ice up and you get um, clumps. Um, but yeah, raising the roof or getting when you're setting up a new bin, having space on that roof so it runs straight out of the bin. That's definitely one option as a passive means. Um, but there's definitely um, starting to look at yeah putting fans. Um, it doesn't have to be on the top inlet of your bin, um, but uh, roof designs that have yeah fans along the the edge to to pull that moisture out. Um, another thing is making sure you have enough airflow from the bottom so that it it, um, it pushes it right out um, uh, before it hits. So there's a couple. It depends. It really depends on what your bin setup is um, and whether you have to yeah retrofit or you're setting up a new bin. But definitely if you're setting up a new bin, those are considerations to keep in mind. So you've kind of answered all the questions so far. There's, you only need half horsepower fans and there's the ones you can buy. Goes right on the side of your roof. Uh, turn them on from the bottom. And the, the idea is to put, to pump cold air in so it doesn't condensate on the roof sheet, right? 
and we have a couple of those. Hello. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, could you speak more to what you said earlier, if I understood right, Joe, that you're pulling back from some of the intercropping? Um, we've seen a lot of information about the potential benefits uh, on the economic side, weed control, disease control. Um, so trade-offs, but why are you heading back to less intercropping? Um, so the crops, we do still uh, intercrop flax and lentils, because the lentils are the ones that usually it's a hard time to keep clean. Like we keep, we do those crops that work together well, um, and there has to be a reason why you intercrop them. Um, if you do peas and mustard, you use peas that usually lay down, right? There's a reason you do that. Um, what we found though is if you do too many and if you make it too complicated, it's, you create more work. We ran into problems with one crop was ripening, ripening off earlier, the other one took two or three more weeks until they were mature. So you kind of lose the quality side on the one crop because you're still waiting on the other one to get to finish up. So, and then it's always, it sounds good until you sit there in November and then you have to start separating. And it's just a lot of times we make our life hard for no reason. That's why we are moving more into the clovers where we just, we have the same idea that can grow together and have the disease suppression, depre suppression and uh, the, um, feed each other with nitrogen and, and, and have the biodiversity there. But you don't have that extra work after harvest and you don't have to work to wait on the crop to ripen. That's just what we found. Um, yeah, we, that's pretty much our only intercrop this year is flax and, and lentils, oats and peas, I guess. Right in the middle here. Uh, Charlie, I think I'll point this towards you, but you other two can probably comment on this because I'm sure you remember uh, fan controls that were set up and I think it was always humidistats that controlled them and turned on and off throughout the day and through the night. Are there any, I know they didn't work very well because you were always moving that front throughout the bin and causing problems at different places, but are there newer controls that are actually that do a good job of monitoring that or are you still better to watch that forecast that you talked about Charlie and then turn them on until it's dry and turn it off when you're done yeah so they all kind of run off the same principles um, so you're there's really no technology that's found a better way to forecast that the, the reality with weather is that it changes so it fluxes so much over the day over the over the week um, so as far as technology, I wouldn't say that there's um, a, better, a better system for that. Um, but as far as how we apply those um, principles, um, turning on and off, we don't necessarily recommend unless it's, um, unless you're really not, you're looking at your, your charts and you're not going to see um, any drying or it's going to possibly add moisture to your bin. Um, but then that's where the addition of a heater on your bin comes in hand. So if you add just a little bit of heat, it cuts your humidity down, which improves it drastically. So, so that's kind of my, um, what I'm moving towards as a recommendation. If, if you can add a little be, bit of heat and that allows you to keep your fans on all the time and um, not risk um, that front sitting anywhere, um, that, that, that's definitely something to keep in mind. Any more, oh my goodness. Are there any more questions from the, there's another one back there. Do you have a mic? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, another additional question about natural air drying or supplemental heated or whatever is uh, we found it difficult to know just where you were at for grain moisture at any time. And, uh, you know, the old saying used to be you ran the fan until the grain on the top was dry and then the rest of the grain would be the same. But, uh, you know, without putting a bunch of uh, expensive monitoring cables in your bin, is there any sort of rule of thumb that you can use to gain an understanding of where your drying front is? I haven't come up with one yet. Um, yeah, in general, yeah, when you're adding heat to it, you're going to have over drying at the bottom, and um, it's still going to be tough. So um, maybe we can come up with an idea to find an average. So if there's a relationship um, between maybe it's still a little tough on the top, but if you can take a sample from top and bottom and average, um, maybe that's, um, that's a way um, to approach that. But yeah, without really putting some sort of monitoring system is going to be your best best insurance policy. We have one just in the center here. Uh, quick question for Joe. Uh, are you putting the clover on at the same time you're planting the crop, or are you staggering it later so it's not as big a problem at harvest? Uh, the, the yellow blossom we seed at the same time on probably 80% of the acres. If we do have winter rye, we're gonna do it on our last harrow pass. But broadcasting and herring in is always, do we get rain or not, right? It's a problem. For us, on, and I don't know why, we have trouble getting uh, crimson clover started, Persian clover. We have a little bit better luck with red clover um, but for us, yellow blossom is always the one that comes right away. So I don't know if you have trouble starting clovers, maybe try a different one. Like I spent way too much money on crimson clover the last three years and I didn't see hardly anything. Is it always problematic at harvest time? Um, the yellow blossom, Yes, because it likes to grow. It, it, it grows up with your crop or out of your crop. So it's not the stem that's the problem, it's the green leaves that are the problem. Because you knock them off and they end up in, your, in the sample. And like this here, it, yeah. It, if you put it in a swath for two days, it's enough to cure out the leaves that they go through the combine. Um, and then you, the other thing is, it has a distinct smell to it, and if it's strong enough, you're going to end up with wheat that smells like yellow blossom sweet clover, which some we might be able to turn that into some specialty flavored flour, but um, not everybody wants it. I've got one more for all of you guys. Um, I think that was a bench, that kind of double scalper cleaner that you showed, Joe, that you said you really liked. I looked at them and they're not cheap uh, for the scale that I was after. And I wonder if, if there's anybody else making those or if you feel like, like when I look at it, there's not a lot to it, but I think it was a $60,000 machine. No, it's, uh, Garrett makes them in Milestone. They're only, I don't know if I should tell, it's, I think 28 I, I paid for it. Look, if you find two or three more guys, put it on the trailer and back up to the bin and do your intercropping separating. I like him a lot better than the rotary. The rotary is, um, like the one I showed, it's supposed to be a thousand bushel an hour. I've never gotten that out of it, and it's a big mess by the time you're done, and I hate mess. So it had to go, but find one, two, three guys, put them on a car trailer, and um, maybe go that way. Yeah, it doesn't, and those one, that one actually, if you have peas and, just trying to think what we did, peas and oats, and we did for 4.50 an hour, separating it, and we did a, like a really good job really on both.
I'm sorry if you covered this question because I was out talking to somebody for part of the presentations, but I'm wondering about a stripper head or harvester. Do you see any virtue in that in the future? Is Travis here? Travis Hyde? No? Okay, so I can answer it actually. Um, I tried and it's, it works well, but what are you going to do? You have to have another pass mowing down the straw. Um, and the field I tried it on, I thought, you know, I'm going to be really smart. I'm going to go no-till organic. And it was the biggest failure I ever had because I had too much straw the, next, the year after. And I had no tools to have a weed control. So the stripper had a yes, it's fast. Um, it does a good job. You have, I think, I find that you have more loss on the header than you would normally have. And then what are you going to do with the straw? If you have a disc and you work it in anyways, maybe that's, but usually it's an old till tool and it looked really good until the saw thistle came. And then it didn't look good at all. I, okay, there we go. So I, I understand that, and um, I, I wonder if you could though, further comment on the role of the stripper header, uh, uh, because this, this question comes up uh, in terms of both dealing with the sweet clover leaves uh, and also uh, helping maintain the quality of the wheat in a difficult harvest where your alternative might be to windrow. Um. I can tell you, I did, I did strip some alfalfa and I still had the leaves in it. So uh, I don't know if it, get rid, if it will get rid of the leaf problems and uh, I still stripped the leaves off and they ended up. Um, yes, you don't have, I mean, every time you put it in a swath, you need at least two or three days of good weather before you can come in with the combine. And that's not, it's not dry by then. I don't know, the problem is, do you want to spend that much money on, uh, on a header as a different tool? Maybe just don't spend the money and lift your header up and just take the head, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's just, I had two of them and I, I wasn't too happy with them and the money tied up in the headers, I, t I just thought, you know what, we're going to spend it on something else. And it's because our problem is what are we going to do with the tall straw at the end of the year? Thanks. I have uh, one quick question and then we'll t toss it back to see if we have any last ones in the audience. But this one's for Nick and for Joe. Charlie talked a little bit about um, size differentiation and moisture migration in the bin. In your experiences and harvest, like knowing harvest can be a really busy time, have you had any sick, can you just talk about um, either intercrops or situations that you've had high dockage that you've been able to successfully store before separating or what examples you would absolutely separate before you store? Uh, yeah, so this year uh, we grew a bit of wheat and flax. Um, it was slightly tough but not too bad and we actually built some uh, some drier bins, I guess you'd call them, with full floor aeration. Um, the fan, like a big fan and propane heaters and the vents on the roof and the fans in the roof. Um, kind of the whole, what they suggest you could do short of a stirring system in the bin, I suppose. Um, and we found that definitely um, the, the flax definitely did create a density issue and an airflow issue. Um, we got away with it because we stored the grain, we dried it down, uh, we didn't fill the bin more than half full, um, and then we, we cleaned it right away. And as we cleaned it, we noticed that we were just in time, the grain was going to start to heat. Um, so my advice for that would definitely be if you're using static drying and you have different densities of grain, you dry it and you move it. Don't leave it in that bin because you're likely going to have some hot spots. We did flax chickpeas and actually chickpeas helped with airflow. So they were both tough a bit. Um, 
we put them in a bin and just air dry them. Um, so the chickpeas actually help with airflow. Um, if they're both dry, I mean, if peas are 16 and canola is 10, I wouldn't worry about it. Sometimes I think we make it, we're too worried about things. And, you know, we, if we have 25% dockage in wheat, we never worried about dockage heating, I guess. And it's kind of the same thing. Just if you, put in, if you put them in both tough, then yes, you do have to worry about it. But if they're close to dry, we never had issues in the last, what is it now, five or six years. And I don't separate anything off the combine. It's all done when we're done, like in the, in the winter. All right, thank you. Are there any final burning questions from the audience or comments? Oh, one over here. So we're uh, farmers that sold our swath hair uh, when we were doing conventional farming. Now we transitioned to organic, so we bought the same swather back. Uh, different, well, the same kind of swather. Uh, it's better shape, though. Uh, so we're ahead that way. Um, so this is a question. So we had a, I had a debate with my brother last year about uh, when we should be um, swathing our wheat, because the assumption is we've got to swath wheat, because it's organic now, and there's some weeds um, and it was always, okay, there's rain in the forecast, so no, we don't want to swath. So we just waited and waited and waited, and suddenly we had dead ripe wheat uh, with some weeds. And so what we discovered is uh, combining like dead, dead ripe wheat with some weed leaves and so on, it didn't seem to be a big deal, actually, um, because the leaves seemed to dry down really quickly in an aeration fan. So do you think that we maybe um, don't need the swather um, if, uh, because we're, yeah, it's Manitoba farming, right? We're always stealing windows of opportunity. Um, and so maybe, um, maybe we should be a little more risk taking and let the wheat stand and um, it's not that big a deal. You know, um, last year was a good example. We swathed some stuff. Um, it was uneven, the crop was uneven. Some was dead ripe, 30% was dead ripe. 30% um, was probably 18 moisture and there was still 10% that was like dose stage. And the forecast looked good, we knocked her down, next morning we woke up, rain in two days. And you actually, I was amazed how fast stuff dries down, even the dose, the, one, the stuff that was in dose stage, it dried down really quick. And even though you combine it and the stuff is 20% moisture, you leave it in the bin for a day, it all evens out a bit, and then you can dry it down. And I think sometimes we wait too long swathing crops. Um, I wouldn't get rid of the swather. On the leaf material you were talking about, uh, sometimes you take a sample, combine a truckload, put it in a pail, put a lid on it, and the next morning look, just see what it does. A lot of times, what you just said, talked about is the leaves are totally dry. And yeah, I think sometimes we wait too long. You have to take the risk because I think the risk combining at 16, 7% moisture is less than leaving it out there and having it rain on and then you turn your $18 weed into $9 feed weed. And we're taking risk all year, really. Might as well take it at the end of the... Well, thank you very much. I think we'll um, stop there just because we're about to serve lunch. But if you could join me in, in sharing our appreciation to Joe and Nick and Charlie for uh, sharing their knowledge with us.